wanted to take a minute and celebrate the first powered controlled flight on another planet. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Virtual high fives all around, COVID safe. All right, now I uh, wanted to note that we are gonna take some questions. Uh, uh, those of you on the media telecon, if you wanna put yourself in the queue, please press star one. Uh, anyone with questions can also ask questions using the hashtag Mars Helicopter. Okay, so let's get started with Steve Jurisic, who will then hand over to uh, Michael Watkins at the lectern. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, so first, I just wanna congratulate the team on an amazing historic first. Um, congratulations uh, to, to Mimi, Bob, and Ovard. Um, just amazing, like you said, first control powered flight on another planet, Planet, just truly amazing. I also wanna congratulate the entire Perseverance team. Uh, you know, this the helicopter was added somewhat late you know, to the project, which made it really challenging, not only for the helicopter team, but also for the Perseverance team. Um, so for, for uh, John and um, Matt um, and the Perseverance team who had to uh, integrate, that figure out how to integrate the helicopter on Perseverance and deliver it to the surface and deploy it. And, uh, and for Jen and, uh, and her team, the ops team who supported uh, this historic first flight. Congratulations to everybody. It, this was this was really a um, all hands on deck effort. Um, it involved Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, the Space Technology Mission Directorate, and the Science Mission Directorate. It involved um, JPL, of course, but also the Ames Research Center and the Langley Research Center. It was really an, a, a unique, somewhat unique integration um, of our aeronautics research um, talent and capabilities and our space systems development um, capability um, that real was, was able to uh, to do the, accomplish this amazing, amazing flight uh, very early this morning. Uh, just to, I, I feel like I've uh, followed along with the team uh, while I was at Langley and then at headquarters in Space Tech and then in the, in the associate administrator role, I think a trip to JPL about once every year and they'd always take me over to Mimi's Mimi's lab, the Mars helicopter lab, and Mimi would tell me what they've accomplished and all the challenges they've had and what they've had to overcome. And her just excitement and enthusiasm for making this happen, making this happen was infectious. Um, and uh, I think her leadership, along with the talent of the team, uh, made me believe that they could do it, and they did. So uh, again, congratulations. Um, Many, many challenges, uh, including having to complete um, complete the helicopter development during a global pandemic. Um, they had to get the size and weight of the helicopter down so they could achieve, you know, lift uh, using rotary blades in a in a very thin atmosphere. And uh, and then of course they had another late challenge with, with having to do a software. Uh, uh, change and update um, and do that with uh, a helicopter 180 million miles from from Earth. So just a, just an amazing job. Um, this really is a Wright Brothers moment. Um, it's the start of a whole new kind of planetary exploration um, and uh, engin and we'll build on ingenuity success um, to see how we can deploy this capability on future future Mars missions. Um, we, we have this evolution of uh, exploring um, planets in the solar system, first we do a flyby, then we'll do an orbiter mission, then we'll do a lander mission, then we'll land a rover, and now we've added another evolutional capability there, a uh, flight on another planet. Um, Ingenuity is a top, was a technology demonstration, an experimental mission, um, and uh, but it, it, its success is, is, is truly remarkable and it gives us this, this new capability. I believe, um, along with uh, with Mike and Thomas, that we should be doing these uh, types of technology demonstrations on all our science missions um, to take advantage of, of the ability to prove out new technologies and capabilities that will then feed forward to even more uh, ambitious and productive missions in the future. Uh, so you all have exemplified what it means to be part of this, this amazing NASA team. Um, Many, many, uh, many organizations, and um, and you came up with this sort of this dream, 
and this innovative idea, and you came, overcame all the challenges and made it happen. This could be not more could not be more proud of the team. Um, again, you know, in in the global pandemic, launching perseverance, landing perseverance, and now deploying and flying the helicopter, um, just just incredible, just incredible. And congratulations again. Um, you do you all really personify um, the motto of dare mighty things and embody our nation's spirit of persevering even in the most challenging situation. And uh, you, you are providing inspiration and advancing science and exploration for not only the United States, but for the world. So congratul congratulations again. And with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Mike Watkins. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, it has been a great day here at JPL, and uh, we're very proud uh, that we are, are continuing to be at the forefront of daring mighty things in planetary exploration. And I wanted to build on something that you noted, uh, which is that uh, ingenuity is a, a technology demonstration, right? It builds for the future. And in many ways, uh, it is a perfect example of how we need to be doing technology and how we need to develop technology. And uh, the brilliant engineers, some of whom you'll see uh, in the orange shirts, um, you know, came up with the idea for ingenuity for a Mars helicopter before we uh, had a name ingenuity uh, over seven years ago. And, uh, and, and there was a push from technology, but it wasn't quite clear at that time, uh, was it really the right uh, instrument, was it really the right uh, 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 thing, a helicopter, to put on, on the Perseverance rover? And so we did what we felt was right, which was we stuck to it, and we kept working on, on, on the Mars helicopter. We kept overcoming technological hurdles, and we kept showing why it would be valuable as a scientific instrument in the future. And a combination of, of rugged support uh, uh, from JPL in terms of, 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 of technology development, as well as NASA headquarters, uh, and an exceptional team that overcame all the technical technological challenges one by one until it became obvious that the right thing to do was to put it on Perseverance and fly it to Mars uh, as a full demonstration. And I think that's the kind of partnership, the kind of push of technology and pull of science uh, that we are now seeing to be very productive within NASA. And actually, we're working on several other missions uh, that have te technology uh, components, uh, much like Ingenuity, uh, but going to other parts of the solar system uh, as well. Now, uh, our brilliant team uh, has overcome a number of challenges. And uh, for those of you that remember back in 1997, um, we had a mission called Mars Pathfinder and had effectively a, a technology demo uh, called the Sojourner Rover. And that freed us up from being in the, spot, the place we stuck the landing to being able to drive around. And now, now of course, those rovers have become curiosity and, and our latest perseverance, capable of driving tens of miles on the surface and going to the best places for scientific discovery. Well, what, what the Ingenuity team has done is given us the third dimension. They've freed us from the surface now forever in planetary exploration so that we can now make a combination, of course, of driving on the surface and sampling the surface and doing reconnaissance and even scientific experimentation on inaccessible places for a rover. And I think this is exactly the way we build the future. And I think you'll hear a lot more about the scientific promise uh, of, of uh, rotorcraft on Mars as part of, of and, and other planets uh, as part of the uh, science mission director at Portfolio. And to talk about the importance of ingenuity and some of the future, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Thomas Zurbuchen, who is the associate administrator for the science mission directorate at NASA headquarters. Thomas. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. And uh, I, I just want to tell you, uh, as I'm starting here, I'm just so proud to be on the, up here uh, next to Mimi, and especially that team here also on the monitor. And I just want to tell you on behalf of all of us at NASA Science, how proud we are of you and how we recognize how important you are for this particular success. So I just want to ask one more time, everybody, to join me. The story of this team is compelling. It's a story of a great, perhaps even a crazy idea initially. Many people, uh, you know, have a really hard time. It turns out we all have a hard time, you know, finding that right line between crazy and innovative. It turns out we're often wrong with that line. A crazy idea that uh, was being developed and this team put that idea into reality. The most important thing that takes, of course, is hope. It's the hope that that is actually possible.
to come together with, the, with, with everything this team has, with the personal education, with the commitment to success, and with learning from each other until it actually works. So for me, uh, what I want to point to is the first picture here. And I want to just tell you, uh, this picture means two things for me. On the one hand, I recognize that this picture was taken from the Fun Seal Overlook. And my friend Jacob is no longer with me. I see in this picture because I know that he was an important part of making this helicopter happen. The second thing uh, that is important in this picture is what you don't know right now uh, as you look at it, it's actually the after flight picture. And so it landed there and it landed on the surface after this flight and it did so safely. And so for me, again, what I see in this is now not only this amazing little machine, but the team that actually achieved that. And it relates this to a story that's 117 years apart and 173 million miles apart, a story that actually started even earlier with a little toy that a father brought home to two kids. They were about 10 years old. It's a rubber band with a little rotor. It's a little toy that never got out of their mind. They became bicycle mechanics and they started working on this and actually did that famous record in 1903 when they achieved first control flight on this Earth. So when we look at the uh, previous picture that I just showed, I want to just tell you that in homage of this amazing achievement we have designated, and please pull up the next picture, have designated this landing site as the Wright Brothers Field. We are so excited to have these two stories, the story of ingenuity and their team related to the Wright brothers. And I just want to tell you as we uh, go forward, actually, that connection has already been made and we talk about it. I have here in front of me a little sample of the flyer, actually, the actual fabric that did that historic act in 1903. And what I want to show you in the next movie is actually how this sample, you see there's a piece missing in what I just showed you. In the next movie I show how this piece that is missing was actually included on this flyer and this morning made history together uh, with it. So, so for me, uh, Mimi team, Ingenuity team, you know, history connecting those two amazing stories together has been made this morning. And uh, why don't you tell us more, Mimi Young, about it? Hey, thank you, Thomas. Well, our team has been working over six years, some even longer, towards that dream of experimenting the first ever flight at Mars. And this morning, our dream came true. If we can play this video, this is from, taken from Perseverance Rover, video of our, our dream, just beautiful. Taking off, goosebumps. It looks just the way we had tested in our test chamber, space simulation simulator chamber here. Absolutely beautiful flight. I don't think I can ever stop watching it over and over again. <laughs> ah, and lands. Well, um, when things work, um, it looks easy. I, I would like to take this opportunity to remind how difficult it is to fly a rotorcraft at Mars. Uh, first and foremost, uh, because the atmosphere there is so thin, right? About 1% compared to that at Earth. That's like on Earth being elevation three times the height of Himalayas. So the air is very thin and ingenuity had to be really light, small, and um, has to be able to fly in this thin atmosphere and survive on its own. It did all of that uh, under four pounds. So um, Bob Bellram uh, will be talking more of that, but I did want to remind that. Well, this morning was an incredible moment. Our team reaction here this morning, this video. It was around 3.30 a.m. this morning, but it sure didn't feel like early in the morning. It just felt like a <laughs> very normal middle of the day 
externally exciting. Data products confirming that we unpacked image and one hertz data. This is downlink handing off to flight control for telemetry analysis. Swash plate servos appear healthy. Overall actuators appear healthy. This is flight control confirming that we have EVRs from Ingenuity. Ingenuity is reporting having performed spin up, takeoff, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown, and spin down. And I'll Altimeter data confirmed that Ingenuity has performed its first flight, the first flight of a powered aircraft on another planet. Unforgettable day, unforgettable day. And you know, it's all about the team to start with. Really, you know, our team across JPL, Ames, Langley, with our industrial partners, Aerovironment, Qualcomm, Solero, Lockheed, others. We were a team, I mean, just a strong team. And during this morning downlink, I did say that we had many friends who contributed to our success, okay, and including Perseverance Rover team and many, many others. And some of them are far away now. And again, as Thomas mentioned, Jacob, Jacob Vinziel, I'm, I'm sure you were watching our first flight from the Jacob Overlook. So we're thinking about you, David. I mean, I'm thinking about you, Jacob. So with that, um, this early morning uh, flight, what it means for our mission success. Um, Mars Helicopter Ingenuity Technology Demonstration Project has three goals in align with NASA's agency level objectives. So the first is to show on Earth that it is possible to fly power control flight at Mars. We did that uh, before we were launched. And then the second goal was to actually fly at Mars. We have done it. This is the first time I've been able to say we've done it. And the third uh, goal is to uh, get data back that will inform engineers that are going to design, that are designing future generations of Mars helicopters. And we have done that too, and we're gonna continue. So beyond this first flight, over the next coming days, we have up to four flights planned, and increasingly difficult flights, challenging flights, and we are gonna continually push all the way to the limit of this rotorcraft. We really want to push the rotorcraft flights to the limit and really learn and get information back from that. So with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to Bob Bellarum, our chief engineer and really the innovator of our original design for Mars helicopter. Over to you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Mimi. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, take a moment to thank all of you who have been on this journey with me. Uh, there's been a many a technical conversation, many a late night, many a test, and I thank, want to thank all of you who have been part of that, and your families and your loved ones who have helped you know, get us to this point. Ingenuity itself is extremely healthy at this point. In fact, she is even healthier than she was before this flight. She shook off some of her dust that had been covering her solar panel and is in fact producing even more solar energy uh, than before. Uh, the batteries are looking good. The um, communication system is fantastic. Uh, the landing gear appears to have worked well. All the server mechanisms and motors are doing great. The um, computers and the avionics behaved uh, flawlessly. So all in all, it's in a perfect state. Um, and I'm just really excited to see what all she can teach us over the next few weeks uh, as we explore aerial mobility on Mars. And uh, with that, uh, Howard, if you can tell us about exactly what happened during this flight, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, this uh, flight was all about proving that it is possible to fly on Mars. Uh, so to that end, uh, what we had instructed Ingenuity to do was to climb uh, to altitude of three meters, hover there for a little bit, about five seconds, then make a turn of about 96 degrees, hover for another 20 seconds, and then 
go to land again in the same place that it took off from. And we told, that's what we told Ingenuity to do, and it did exactly that, and it did it just perfectly. Uh, from everything we've seen so far, uh, it was a flawless flight. Uh, it was a gentle takeoff. Uh, at altitude, it gets pushed around a little bit by the winds, but, uh, but it really just maintained station uh, very well, and it stopped the landing uh, right in the place where it was supposed to go. Um, when we were looking at the downlink data this morning, one of the first things, or the, one of the most important things that we were looking for was uh, this plot that you can see, which is a plot of the altimeter. Um, that was really our first indication, or real proof, I should say, that, yeah, we really did leave the ground. Uh, uh, we really did fly. Uh, in addition to this kind of telemetry, during the flight itself, Ingenuity was telling us all along what it was doing. And so what we were able to do with that data is we could take that data and, and reconstruct the flight and create an animation out of it. So, so what we're gonna see here is such a reconstruction. Uh, or we, we've taken that engineering data and, and animated the flight accordingly. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to look at the flight in a different way uh, for example, from different angles up close and see kind of the small motions of the vehicle. Uh, and what you will see here is that it's just really, you know, really steady. Um, just a, a beautiful flight. This is the initial hover and then a turn. And then uh, hover again for 20 more seconds. And then the landing. And just the tiniest little bounce that you can see there on the landing. Uh, and that is also completely expected. I think we are, uh, have uh, a video as well from the rover that we looked at before that we're going to see again. And this again, you know, shows us the same thing, this time with real images uh, from the vantage point of the rover. And it shows you when you get up to altitude here uh, a little bit more clearly how how it gets buffered a little bit by the wind and how it very uh, gently makes its way back and, and lands safely where it needs to be. And what's exciting about this is this is a flight that we've done hundreds, if not you know, a thousand times before, but always in simulation. It's always been on a computer. And to see it now finally happen on Mars and happen exactly the way that we imagine it is just a really incredible uh, feeling. Now, while it was flying, um, it ha while it's flying, it has to keep track of where it is. And the way that it does that, in part, is by taking images of the ground below it, 30 images per second, and analyzing those in order to understand how it's moving. Now, those are, those Images are primarily there exactly for that purpose, not necessarily there to be looked at, you know, um, but it turns out, you know, we grabbed a few of those images uh, and downlinked them to Earth this morning, and it turns out they're, they're absolutely stunning uh, in what they show. What we see here is Ingenuity taking a picture of its own shadow right below it, and I think this is just a stunning uh, image, notwithstanding the fact that it's, you know, a low resolution uh, black and white uh, photograph. We have another uh, image from the same camera, which shows just a moment right before touchdown. You can see the legs are just about to meet the ground here. And this is a very interesting image to me in part because of uh, what it doesn't show, which is it doesn't show a lot of obscuration from dust, which is one of the things 
that we weren't so sure about prior to, uh, prior to doing this experiment. So already we're learning things here. Uh, uh, and in particular here, dust is, did not seem to be an issue in terms of obscuring the navigation camera close to the ground. In the next few days, uh, we expect uh, to perform further flights and we also expect to get color images down from the helicopter. Now, one more thing that I want to mention here is that the International uh, Civil Aviation Organization has assigned us a three-letter designator for ingenuity, e IGY, India Golf Yankee, with the call sign ingenuity. And those details will be officially included in the next edition of ICAO's designators for aircraft operating agencies, aeronautical authorities, and services. And the location of the flight was assigned an ICAO locator, location designator, JZRO, for Jezero Crater, where the NASA Mars operation took place. And of course, uh, these designators come in handy uh, when we go to write our log in our logbook. This is something that should be very familiar to any pilot out there. We always want to log our flights so we don't forget that we did them. And so for that purpose, we have, you know, this, I have this logbook with me. It says uh, the nominal pilot's logbook for planets and moons, because we're always thinking ahead here at NASA. So with that, um, I'd like to talk with, to, uh, to Justin, who will talk more about the imaging. Okay, thank you, Havard. Uh, I'm Justin Mackey. I'm the uh, Perseverance uh, Rover Imaging Scientist and also the Deputy PI of MassCam-Z. And I'm here, uh, just really happy to be here to share with you the results of our imaging over the last uh, few hours on Mars. Um, I, there's sort of two cameras that we're, we're talking about. The, the video camera is the MassCam-Z camera, which is a science camera that uh, PI is Jim Bell at Arizona State University and his team over there. And it was built by Malin Space Science Systems down in San Diego. Uh, Mike Kapl Kaplinger, uh, Mike Ravine um, with the hardware group built an excellent piece of hardware for us. And also Jensen, Jensen running the ops team down there. Uh, and Kim Saxon here um, at JPL as our instrument engineer. And a whole team of people uh, made this happen. So I just want to just thank all of them um, for getting us to this point. Uh, and then the other camera, I'll show some pictures of from the ECAM system, the nav navigation cameras on the rover um, with uh, our ops team. Those, those cameras were built here at JPL and our ops team, Nick Ruoff and Amy Culver. So uh, just credit to the entire rover team. I'm wearing my rover blue here. I'm actually on the heli team also, but I had to pick a color. So I'm representing the rover team here the uplink and downlink engineering teams, uh, just keeping the rover running, the orbiters, our partners, um, getting us all this data is just really amazing and we thank all of them, both here in NASA and ESA, TGO, and also the Deep Space Network. So I just wanted to thank all of these people for making this really happen. They, they enable all this work. Um, so with that, um, without further ado, I guess we'll go to the video one more time because you cannot see this enough. And by the way, it only came down about two hours ago, the full frame. So let's go ahead and show the video. I'll talk a little bit about it. It's a um, 720p video. It's 1280 by 720 pixels. Um, it's, it runs at about 6.7 frames per second. Um, and we originally had the strategy of downlinking down the 2.4 second snippet. So there it goes. You can see it taking off. And if you look carefully, you can see it turning in flight. People have talked about that. And this is new. This just came down right before this press conference. Turning in flight and then coming back and landing. Um, so I mentioned the, uh, the frame rate. This is with our wide ang one of our wider angle settings on the camera, 34 millimeters. So it's a little more a contextual shot. We also shot a, f a full zoomed version on the heli itself where the heli flies out of the field of view. We have not downlinked those full frame images yet. Uh, so we're expecting those in the coming days. Um, we did verify from the imagery that the heli did take off about th uh, three meters above the surface, so that's an independent verification. Um, the, the heli blades are a little blurred um, due to the, uh, it's about a 10 millisecond exposure, which is about a, an, a, an one half rotation of the blade at 2600 RPM, roughly, it's like 0.4. Um, and let's see, and we've, so far we've received about 14 or a little over 1,000 uh, frames. I counted 1,400 last, last check out of about 2,000. So once again, the orbiter performance has really made this 
possible to even show you this so quickly to get high, to get video from the surface of Mars. So um, it's really an amazing, just amazing feat by everybody. So uh, the next image then is again going back to the fully zoomed 110 millimeter mass cam Z uh, picture of the heli on the ground. Um, Again, this is just a, a nice shot showing if you look closely, it may be hard to tell if you if you look closely at the center, you can see that there's a camera on the helicopter itself that is now facing the rover and it was not facing the rover before. So that's proof that it did turn in flight. Um, and it's just a, a nice shot showing that the heli landed safely. And uh, that's just a, a great picture to have. So then the next picture is now switching cameras. We're going to go to the nav cam camera and the nav cam camera is uh, does not have the video capabilities like mass cam z but we did take pictures during the flight and this this blink hopefully it'll blink you'll see the heli that's the heli on the ground there looking carefully look okay no actually you know what this is the different this is the other one now if you look at carefully at the heli you should be able to see it shifting uh, that shows the difference between the takeoff location and the landing location maybe hard to see in the video uh, but we'll put that out on, on the, uh, we'll release that so people could look at that uh, more closely. I can see it from here, but it, hopefully it'll come out in the video. Uh, so it just shows that the landing was just sort of a real pinpoint landing there by the team. And uh, so congrats to the heli team for just nailing it, Harvard and company. Uh, and then the last video, um, or the last blink GIF shows, ho hopefully it shows the full height there. There it is. Okay. So we have the full height of the, the helicopter there captured by the nav cam mid-flight. And then uh, a comparison with the heli then on the ground, um, which will show the, um, the full height. It's hard to see the video there from here. But the main summary is that we actually, you know what, I'm looking at this. This looks like this is the mass cam Z again. Well, we just got the data all down, so it sounds like it might be slightly out of order. I think the main point here is that we are swimming in data right now, and we are we're just, a, just cataloging it, basically, and, and learning about the flight. Uh, we're just extremely happy for this uh, this whole team, uh, the rover team and the, the heli team. Uh, and I just wanted to close uh, my statements by mentioning, uh, I mentioned that I, I'm on the, I was on the heli team. This is like with, with Bob like seven years ago where we were talking about taking pictures from a heli. Seeing it all come together like this is really reminiscent of another project that I worked on 24 years ago, This uh, the Mars Pathfinder mission where we had a, the Sojourner rover, which was a new technology, a new capability. There were skeptics at the beginning, and then uh, once something like this happens on Mars, the skeptics get converted, and it, it, it soon becomes a new way of doing things. And I really feel this project, this team, has the same vibe that, that we had 24 years ago with Sojourner. Uh, just seeing going from a concept to demonstration like this is going to open up new avenues and new ways of exploring. So. Very exciting. We're very excited uh, that this is all working so well and um, just happy to get all this data back. All right. Thanks, Justin, and thanks for rolling with it. As Justin says, the images are all coming down in a fire hose, um, and we will make uh, the images available for you all online, so look for it on the website. So we're going to transition now into Q&A. Um, so a reminder for our uh, colleagues uh, from the media, if you're on the telecon line, please press star one to get into the queue. And for others who are using social media, you can use the hashtag Mars Helicopter. Our first question on the media line comes from Marsha Dunn of the AP. Yes, hi, congratulations. Um, I've got a couple questions for the chief pilot, I believe, Mr. Grip. Um, what was the wind speed at Wright Brothers Field this, uh, today for the flight? And when are you anticipating to attempt flight two? I know you had a schedule laid out in advance, but since you're a week down on the timeline, I wasn't sure if you were going to try to rush things along. Thank you. Yeah, so in terms of the winds, uh, we did take uh, additional data during uh, uh, the flight, and, and we expect to get uh, some more information about what the actual winds were at that time. Uh, what we, what we can operate with is, uh, at this point is the forecast that we have based on prior data. And there is some uncertainty on that, but the most recent uh, indications that I have is that it was on the order of somewhere between two to six meters uh, per second of, uh, of wind, and that's what we were dealing with. And that would seem 
just eyeballing the behavior of the flights, that doesn't seem inconsistent with, with the uh, behavior, although it's hard to, to say much more than that. As far as when we perform next flight specifically, I'll, I'll let Mimi perhaps answer that question. Sure, yeah, so we'll get the high rate data downlink from the helicopter to us tomorrow, uh, and, and then um, we will be uh, attempting to fly within the next few days. So we're targeting for this Thursday, uh, but we'll know more after we get the high rate data. Great, thank you. Our next caller is Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Hi, um, so I was wondering if you had better plans for the fourth and fifth flights. I guess when I talked to Mimi, Bob, and Hover last year, you had mentioned aiming for 500 feet at 50, 15 meters. And I was also wondering, when conceivably might there be a second helicopter on Mars? So in terms of, of the uh, of flights four and five, uh, I think we still have a little bit of team discussion, you know, on basis of just today's flight, the results of that, and what we're gonna get over the next two flights, you know, flights two and three. And that will inform what we do for that. But in, just in general terms, what we're talking about here is going higher, going further, going faster, stretching the capabilities of the helicopter in those ways. But exactly how far in those directions uh, is, is a discussion that we uh, need to have. So regardless, I can add that we will be pushing the envelope. So as we succeed in certain lateral flights, we're gonna go further, faster, definitely, especially towards the end of the experimental window, we will be pushing the envelope and really stretching and understanding how well you know, we can fly. So for the second helicopter question, I think uh, I'll pass it to you, Thomas. Yeah, and of course, I can, the, the answer is, I don't know uh, what the answer is. Uh, when are we gonna uh, fly? I mean, uh, what I'm really interested in is frankly, the science community's idea is about how to turn this into a science machine, you know, from a tech demo into a science machine. And uh, you see uh, what the opportunities are to fly to, uh, fly to Mars. Uh, you know that we have something scheduled in 2628 uh, with Mars sample return, and, but uh, we, we do competitions on a regular basis for, uh, for uh, you know, missions that go elsewhere. Uh, I mean, we're really interested now going forward, but there's nothing set right now into stone as to when the next helicopter will be going to Mars. Okay, great, thank you. Our next caller is Bill Harwood of CBS News. Are you there with us, Bill? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a question for Mamie. Um, you, you said in your blog post uh, over the weekend that you guys had come up with this software fix and you warned us that there was a, you know, maybe a 15% chance it wasn't going to work. You didn't know for sure. And then if it didn't, you just would try again. What is the strategy going forward given the results today? Is that what you would do on flights two, three, or four if one of them gets delayed by this software problem? You would just try again. And I'm wondering, is there a deadline where, where the Perseverance folks really want you to be finished so they can go on with their mission. I'm trying to wonder um, if, if there's some clock running on you guys. Thanks. Absolutely. So this uh, command uh, only uh, option that we chose, the simpler option, uh, it has paid off. We got our first flight in hand. And uh, for the second flight, we will be using the same technique. And so far, it's, been, it's, it's working well. We've been testing it on Ingenuity, and then today it worked well. So we're going to proceed in that direction. Um, in terms of the duration, uh, yes, we have a 30-day experiment window, and so we have about two weeks left, and we will, we believe we'll be able to squeeze the next four flights that we have planned, this increasingly bolder flights. We want to go hundreds of meters out towards the end. We do want to push it, and I believe we have enough time to squeeze the next four uh, flights in the next two weeks left. So again, thank you to Ken Farley, the you know, Perseverance rover team, uh, we, we will be done in our month and you know, the rover needs to go on for his primary mission. That's it, you know, it's, it's very important. So that's the plan. Okay, great. Yes, we have a month of ingenuity <laughs> and still some time left. All right, our next call comes from Steve Gorman of Reuters. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I uh, hope you can hear me. Thanks very much. Um, I, I just wanted to know, uh, I'm not sure you're going to direct this question to exactly, but are there practical implications of this success 
uh, of ingenuity, not only for expanded, enhanced Mars exploration, but for similar modes of, of aerial exploration on other worlds, such as uh, Venus or Titan. Uh, Bob, Bob Bellroom, our chief engineer. Bob, do you want to take that? Uh, yes. Um, you know, the general uh, technique of aerial flight is applicable to, you know, places like Titan and Venus. Uh, the specific vehicle, I think, will be quite different. Uh, Titan is a much easier place to fly, easier even than Earth in some regards. And Venus, has, uh, depending on where you want to fly, has, you know, certain temperature issues. So the specific designs uh, and will be, you know, quite different. But, yes, this does open up that uh, doorway. And I think the, the bigger uh, lesson here, I think, is uh, also how do we operate these vehicles? How do we test these vehicles? So there is uh, that kind of knowledge that we have learned from this uh, process of flying ingenuity that will definitely transfer over and be useful for the folks who will be considering missions to those places. Thank you very much. Okay. Congratulations. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next up, we have Mike Wall of Space.com. Thank you all for doing this. Um, just, just a quick question for probably Justin. Um, just like, could you just just kind of talk a little bit about how difficult it was to to get those shots. It seems like everything is perfectly centered and everything worked extremely well. And I know you guys practiced, but was that tough? And a quick second one, do you guys plan to actually try to capture audio on the next flight, like whenever it happens? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a great question. I can tell you from firsthand experience that that was harder than it looks. Uh, in fact, I think I speak for our entire imaging team that we're kind of relieved that we caught it uh, in flight. We had practiced this um, three, four times before, and this was the first time that we were able to nail it. Um, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting problem. You have two different spacecraft with two different time. They, they both have this roughly the same time, but they operate differently. And so characterizing how the heli operates when we tell it to go uh, compared to how the rover um, does its thing, is actually tricky, and it, it. I mentioned before we had to do this with the Sojourner rover too. You know, two different robots with their own, with their own system. We had to do the same thing here, um, and I think it's a credit to the team that we kept trying and over and over. And, and we were having debates. You know, should we do one long video at one spot or do scatter shot? And so we ended up doing a mixture of both. And um, the fact that it worked out so well is just amazing to all of us, and we're very happy to to be able to show these videos today. So that that's. That's the short, that's the long answer, but it's, it wasn't, it was tricky. I'll just say that. And like I said, we're all breathing a sigh of relief. Um, the second question was, uh, what was the second question? What's that? Oh, the microphone. Yes. Um, we do have a microphone and there is a plan to record the sound. Uh, we didn't want to put that into the first observation or the first try because it was complicated enough just trying to get the, the video to work. Uh, and so we're going to be putting that in an upcoming plan. I'm not sure if it'll be the second flight, but it's certainly one of our later flights. We have two microphones. We have the EDL cam microphone and then the super cam microphone. And I can tell you the microphone owners are very eager to try. And so we're waiting in the wings to, to get them to get a chance to record it. And, and that goes along the lines of, you know, starting out conservative and getting bolder. And one thing, one concern we have is if we turn on the microphone, just in case there's a chance of, you know, EMI uh, interference uh, between the microphone and the helicopter flight. So we really want our birds, a few birds in our hands, and then uh, we'll uh, play with the microphone at that point. Okay, great. Uh, okay, next caller is Paul Brinkman of UPI. Hi, yes, thanks for taking my question. Um, Mimi, I guess I would like to know, um, you kind of hinted at this uh, several times. Um, do you actually want to or expect to see Ingenuity crash at some point um, because you've pushed it to its limits? Um, is that kind of like the ultimate test to see how far it can go? Or what do you ultimately think its fate will be? I've heard some people just in idle conversation wondering if it could tag along with Perseverance to stay in communication range. Um, so what, what will its ultimate fate be? Well, uh, my current view, I believe, you know, as we're together on the team. We do want to push it to the limit. Well, and ultimately, uh, Thomas, Mike, <laughs> just uh, getting your permission. Uh, really, because by going faster, 
further, uh, you know, our models are checking out at this time. They look good, you know, they match, our, uh, our models match what we saw in our test chamber. The flight today perfectly matched, you know, what we were predicting. And so, but we want to push. We want to push against the wind, we want to push against the speed, and um, ultimately we expect the, the helicopter will uh, meet its limit. But that information is extremely important. This is a pathfinder, this is about, you know, uh, finding, is there any uh, unknown unknowns that we can't model? And we really want to know what the limits are. So we will be pushing the limit very deliberately. I think it's also important. And I think, uh, I just want to tell you, this plan was uh, put together by Mimi and her team. And I just want to tell you, it's also important and totally supportive of that plan to actually deal with this like a tech demo. It, we really want to be sure that when everything is said and done, we know the full scope of what's possible uh, with that type of flying machine. And so for us, that's, uh, that's really critical. And for me, kind of really putting kind of a scope, a constraint around it, uh, like the month of ingenuity is very much in the spirit of a tech demo. That's exactly what you would want to do, right? Kind of to make sure that in fact, uh, we're putting the pedal down and are going for it. And I just uh, applaud the entire team and of course, uh, uh, you know, the entire perseverance team to basically who are part of this experiment. So I, I just can't wait to see what the next flights are like, Mimi, and, and uh, as we go forward, how, how this story will go on. All right, well, in the spirit of sort of casting ahead, I'm gonna take a social media question, and I think this one's for Bob. Space Tourism on Instagram asks, do you think you will be able to scale up the concept and fly heavy payloads, and by when? <laughs> Yeah, so the uh, fundamental, you know, dynamics of these vehicles uh, does scale up uh, to fairly reasonable sizes. So we are thinking of things in the uh, 25 to 30 kilogram class, which is, you know, about a 50 pounds type of class of vehicles. Uh, and those vehicles would uh, carry about maybe about four kilograms of science uh, of that order, about 10 pounds of science instruments. And so early design work on that has started to in terms of a conceptual designs and to see what would it take to deploy these and operate them. And so that will be, I think, the, uh, a good uh, sweet spot for the, uh, the next generation uh, design. Uh, anything much larger, the packaging of the blades and things becomes quite awkward, so it may not be quite feasible in the near term, but definitely something in the 50 pound class uh, compared to a little four pound ingenuity is definitely something that's uh, very feasible and exactly like some early progress has been made in that direction. Great, thank you, Bob. Another social media question this time for Mimi. Pete on Twitter asks, what has been the most challenging part about this process? What is the most interesting thing y'all have learned from this flight? Most challenging, well, I think Bob can answer it. Uh, first was meeting that four pound, that 1.8 kilogram limit. You know, uh, it, theoretically it was proven, you know, it is possible to lift, build a helicopter. You know, we knew early on from analysis, the real question, is uh, 1.8 kilogram. And Bob, as a chief engineer, managed those 1,800 grams. And I once saw him arguing with Eric Archer, who again, we have lost, sadly. Over, Bob, do you remember? Was it over two grams or three grams? Eric wanted this uh, telecom hardware that was two more grams or two more grams, and Bob just wouldn't give up. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it made a huge impression. So the, the biggest uh, challenge was the, um, the mass to start with. Yes, sounds like every gram counts. Okay. Uh, all right, we're going to go back to the media lines. And next up is Amina Khan of the LA Times. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I just, I have a couple. Um, we touched upon this a little bit um, already in some of the questions, but I'm just sort of wondering, you know, in your wildest imaginations, we talk about Sojourner being the trailblazer for all these other rovers um, and, uh, you know, all, all of the ones that followed have been so sophisticated. What is the most powerful and sophisticated type of flying planetary explorer uh, you think we might have in the next year, in the coming years and decades, and, and what kinds of um, worlds might they explore? Could you, could you sort of, you know, wax imaginative and, and, and think about what the potential really is here in some specific but imagined ways. I'm not going to hold you to it. I won't come back in 10 years and say, hey, where's my, where's my uh, rover on, where's my flying rotorcraft on Neptune or whatever. But I'd just like to see, so where do you think it could go? Thomas, you want to take this one? 
So the first uh, application of flying vehicles, of course, is track and fly at Titan, uh, in which we have a very different vehicle. And Bob already mentioned it's kind of in many ways simpler because of the stronger atmosphere at uh, Titan than, uh, than the Earth even. Uh, I want to just point out one point I'm sure everybody is thinking about already, but, but knowing how to fly a vehicle like that may actually have applications on Earth too. I mean, I, you know, it's that planet up there uh, at, at these very high altitudes, there's interesting science that I'm sure uh, our Earth science friends are thinking about also now, and uh, whether they're here at, at JPL and elsewhere. I do believe that, uh, that uh, the primary application beyond that is really going to be at Mars. And, and frankly, what, what is in my mind, right, when I look at this and, uh, is, is the, uh, you know, that much of the science, when there's a lot of papers written about you know, from the reconnaissance orbiter, Mars reconnaissance orbiter, is about areas where we cannot bring a rover there. Like, uh, you know, crater walls uh, are really exciting with perhaps, some people say, water seeping out there or some kind of watery mix. Like, is that really the case? Well, to actually figure that out, frankly, you want to probably fly there. <laughs> the final point I'm going to make is Right after the technology demonstration, it's, it's usually a pretty bad place to figure out what, how big the boxes in which the solutions live. And, and I was not there, uh, of course, at, uh, at uh, Sojourner. But you know, we are here from 97, uh, we're here, and we have Perseverance rover and is basically enabling uh, sample return. And for me, like, did in fact the Sojourner uh, people think about a sample return of one of the core uh, applications of this kind of mobility. Uh, perhaps they did, but the point is that is where we're investing major effort and, you know, dollars, uh, attention, and frankly, without mobility, I do not know how we could do this, and it's an absolutely critical science application. So the, the most important thing to learn about these things, it's very hard to predict the future. All right, Justin also wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, 24 years from now, it'll be 2045, if I did my math right. We've been up since 2 in the morning. So um, so I think that the, the, the people that answer that question are maybe people watching this, this press conference right now. The, the kids in school, the kids studying, uh, working hard, learning about science and technology. I think the answer to that question is up to you. So those of you that are getting inspired by this, uh, go into fields of science and technology and decide for yourself what is what is the future look, look like I think that's what the group here did and we just try to be an example to those those watching uh, To to give you that opportunity to answer that question Thank you um, and just a clarification on um, ingenuity and testing it to the limits are, are we looking to fly it as far as possible or as as hard as possible if that makes sense it is uh, a, a question that I don't think we're fully decided on yet, uh, where, where exactly where we want to push it. As I mentioned before, you can, you can talk about flying higher, you can fly farther, you can fly faster. Those are three particular areas where we'll you know, be looking to, in terms of, of possibly stretching the capabilities, uh, assuming that things go well over the next three flights. That's where we'll be looking, but exactly how we prioritize between those different uh, things, um, I think is, is still a discussion that we need to have as a team. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Hovard. I, I think the gist was that it's hard to look into the future, <laughs> but, um, but thank you for the glimpses into the future. Our next caller is Eric Mack of CNET. Yeah, hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, this is looking a little bit far down the road, but I know that uh, NASA has an entire uh, technology transfer office and often likes to uh, spin off its technology, so I wonder if there's been any discussion within the agency of possible applications for this technology here on Earth. So I did not um, check with the technology transfer office, of which we're really proud. Uh, there's a number of technologies that were, you know, transferred in many different applications. In fact, say I met one of my friends told me that he started a whole business uh, based on one of these technologies. I just only learned about this recently. I would not be surprised if uh, you know, a, a company somewhere basically says, this is amazing technology, I wanna learn about it, uh, or uh, you know, whether or not the work is in this particular 
uh, you know, in the research arena, like where we're working or in other arenas that, that could one could imagine, right? I mean, you know, like so much of this is in, in the area of dreams, right? I've been thinking, you know, I can't get out of my mind the amazing movie footage this would be if, if we saw somebody going up Mount Everest and seeing him get off a drone on the outside actually covering that from there. I mean, we've, nobody has ever seen this, you know, like, you know, how, how would that look? I'm not aware of uh, any uh, negotiations right now, but I'm sure uh, uh, if there's interest, uh, the team is ready to support it. Thank you. Great, okay, next caller is Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now, go ahead. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Uh, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Uh, a couple of questions, uh, one for Hovard. Uh, do you happen to know the velocity um, vertical velocity at takeoff and touchdown of the helicopter. And also uh, maybe uh, Mimi Ong can refresh my memory on the flight plan uh, details for flights two and three, uh, since you have those I think already planned out and uh, just refresh my memory on the altitude and uh, distance planned on those, thanks. So I think the question was about the philosophy for takeoff and landing uh, for Ingenuity. And, and so to take, uh, take off first, uh, the way that we take off is we, we boost off the ground uh, with the fixed what we call collective setting that basically provides a thrust that's well above what the aircraft needs to hover. So it, it sort of boosts off the ground with limited control in that very initial you know, split second. And then once it separates from the ground, uh, you know, against just a few centimeters of altitude, then we take full control of the vehicle and guide it up um, to uh, the altitude that it's going. Uh, and that is in our, because we don't want to be fighting against the ground with the legs on the ground. We don't want to be fighting with it uh, by applying full control at that point. We want to separate cleanly, get out of ground effect, and, 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 and then uh, 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 continue controlling. Uh, on landing, uh, our philosophy here is to basically fly towards the ground at a constant speed. Uh, in fact, Ingenuity is commanded to, to fly through the ground and then just stop doing that when it detects that it's not able to do it anymore because that means it's, it's met the ground. Uh, so it uses uh, the onboard uh, inertial measurement units in order to detect that, uh, that it's, it's, it's stopped making progress. Uh, downwards, and then it instantly uh, lowers the collective to stop producing thrust and settles on the ground. And then on the flights uh, two and three, the second flight is to uh, take off like today, except higher to uh, three meters height instead of two, uh, instead of the, sorry, instead of to five meters height instead of the three meters height that we went up to. So we'll go up to five meters height and then fly laterally for about two meters come back the two meters and land uh, from where the exact spot that the vehicle took off on. And then following that, flight three would be again to go up to five meters and then fly laterally uh, 50 meters out and then come back 50 meters and uh, come back. Um, any description, other description you wanna add to those flights, Hobart? Yeah, no, that, that, that about captures it. So, so it's sort of taking things stepwise. Again, the next flight, we will, you know, we, we will be testing higher altitude, so that will be one aspect of it. And then the ability to track to different waypoints that aren't co-located like we have here. And then for that uh, third flight, we would be translating further, and at that point also faster. Uh, you know, normally two meters per second is the, is the uh, 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 is the uh, forward velocity that we'll be using uh, for that third flight. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go to another media question from Joey Roulette of The Verge. Hey, thank you for, for taking my question. Um, this one's for Thomas and it, it kind of echoes some of the other questions already asked, but from a broader perspective, how much more confidence does this flight give you for sending more helicopters to Mars or or other planets, and for Mimi or, or Havard, um, what exactly does pushing ingenuity to its limits mean, and, and how high, I guess, could it go based on the data that you guys are seeing now? Um, and, and is there anything that you guys are seeing in this data that kind of tells you what those limits might be? Thanks. Hey, uh, Joe, we really appreciate the question. Look, I mean, I think of exploration, uh, you know, kind of there's a box somewhere 
in my mind, in which kind of all the things we know how to do are in that box. And kind of every mission that we're flying is a combination of the things we've already proven. Well, since this morning, there's an entirely new tool uh, in that box. And it should be combined with the other things that are there. And I'm very confident that great ideas will emerge with that technology proven here for new missions. I would be very disappointed in the science community and the technology community if they didn't come up with something utterly amazing because of the new dimension that was added by this technology to explore. So for me, I'm confident we'll see a lot of this as we go forward. What it is exactly, I can't tell you today. Yeah, so, so again, in terms of how how far we challenge it and what direction is still a little bit of a discussion, but what I can say a little bit about is, you know, what are the things that are, that we are challenging, you know, if we go, you know, say, faster with the helicopter. Um, one of the things is airspeed. Uh, so uh, the aircraft is, you know, tested up to a certain, uh, certain airspeed. And so by going faster, uh, we would be challenging those limits. And that uh, challenges the uh, aircraft in terms of, of its um, uh, stability margin, its ability to, uh, to handle, uh, uh, to handle uh, those uh, larger uh, uh, airspeeds. Uh, another aspect that we're challenging in that regard is the navigation system, because as I mentioned before, uh, we navigate by taking images of the ground below and as we're traveling faster over the ground, those images, the features in those images disappear from view faster. And so that's another limiting factor, if you will, that we're pushing up against as we start to go faster with the helicopter. In terms of altitude, uh, a main limiting factor there is our, our uh, altimeter, which is actually a laser rangefinder that measures the distance to the ground. And so we're limited by how, how high we can fly um, before, uh, before that stops uh, working uh, properly. And so nominally there, we're looking at uh, probably somewhere, you know, at 10 meters or a little bit more, uh, but not much more than that before we would start to run into to limits with the uh, uh, with laser rangefinder. Well, to put a number on the distance of what, I'd love to push it to 600, 700 meters. So just putting it on the record. <laughs> okay. So anyway, yeah, this sure. is a further team discussion we're going to have. <laughs> I'm, so. I'm being more cautious here, but uh, yeah, we'll, yes. we'll take that discussion. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, next caller is Guy Norris of Aviation Week. Uh, yes, thanks for taking my call and uh, congratulations on an amazing achievement. Um, obviously, you are at the beginning of the first ever extraterrestrial flight test program, I guess. And one of the things I was wondering about, just to, to go back a little bit to what Mimi was saying, was the, the lessons learned, you know, how quickly you'll be able to draw on these lessons learned for the following flight test program, um, or sorry, for the following flight test. So, uh, specifically, the RPM, the, the, the liftoff RPM, and the descent rate that you saw on this first flight, Will you be able to uh, basically work on uh, analyzing whether those were within predictions, as you said? And uh, the last part is just, could you say what these vertical velocities were on liftoff and, and touchdown? Yeah, so, so we will be getting, so the data that we've seen so far is actually fairly limited. Uh, we will be getting in the next few days, we'll be getting a lot more data down from the helicopter, and that'll tell us a lot about how it performed. So in relation to the RPM, for example, the RPM is set based on what we expected the density to be at the time of flight uh, in order to put us in a particular operating regime. And so we, what we will see when we get data down is we'll see what did the helicopter have to do in terms of the controls operating at that RPM? Were we operating at the set point that we thought we would be uh, or were we off from that? And that'll tell us, among other things, you know, something, it'll at least tell us to what extent was the RPM appropriate for the density uh, that, we, uh, that we were at. Uh, so that's one example of that. We'll also get a lot of metrics that'll help us analyze the navigation system. Uh, and, and see how well did it do at tracking features uh, uh, on the ground during flight. And then I, I didn't actually hear the last question that was asked, if you could repeat that. Um, 
It was really just in terms of the uh, the velocity, really, of the. But as you said, I think you're still going through the data. I just wondered if the the touchdown uh, did seem rather sporty in terms of the descent rate. But I presume that, uh, as you mentioned, is part of the philosophy of how you will you approach that landing sequence. Yes, it it is. It definitely is. So uh, we descend at one meter per second, and as as you know, in terms of sportiness, you can see we don't slow down when we, you know, start to near the ground. And there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is we just don't want to hang out, you know, too long in, in ground effect. Um, another reason is we are assuming that we could be obscured by dust when we're operating close to the ground. Now, as you can see from the images, we don't see much, you know, indication of that, but that's been our longstanding assumption. And for that reason, we don't use the camera or the laser rangefinder when we're near the ground. We're just operating based on what's called inertial, uh, inertial measurements. And those tend to drift very quickly. So we want to get, when we're in that mode, we need to get down to the ground quickly. So that's another reason to just aim for the ground at a high, uh, relatively high velocity and not, and not try to slow down too much in the process. And the third reason is because we're using, we're sensing that we're meeting the ground, we want to do that confidently. You know, if, if, we, if we just barely touch it, it's hard to detect that, you, that, that that's what you did. And so we, we touch down confidently. We can, we can very easily detect that we did so, and then we can stop uh, flying. Got it. Okay, all right. We're going to take uh, a social media question here. Um, this is from Amy. Donnie on YouTube asks, what advice would you give for girls and young ladies in school around the world who are interested in pursuing a career in space-related technology? My advice, if you're attracted to it, go for it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it, including yourself. So I like to say, find an intersection of what you like to do, what you're good at, and the cost that you want to you know, make and improve on. Find that intersection of those three. When you find it, like it sounds like you are uh, attracted to STEM, go for it and put, it takes tons of hard work, but it won't feel like hard work because you're gonna enjoy it so much. Your passion's gonna come out of it and you will be able to make whatever you want to make happen. So yes, my biggest advice, don't let yourself talk, talk you out of it and definitely don't let other people talk you out of it. Thank you, Mimi. Okay, we're back to the media lines. Uh, Rick Lovett of Cosmos Magazine, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much. My question has already been answered. Okay, all right, then we will take the next media caller, Leo Enright of Irish Television. Uh, thanks very much, Jairi, and uh, congratulations to everybody. Um, I have a, a semantic question uh, for Bob Ballaram. Um, not, some people may not realize that we journalists are people who look over our shoulders and check what we write. Uh, in Europe and Asia, we call these people sub-editors. Uh, and my sub-editors want to know, why do I keep calling this a helicopter and why do I not call it a drone? Can you uh, help me answer that? And uh, Jairoui, if I could ask a second question um, to uh, Justin Mackey, uh, to know where is Perseverance going to be during this uh, extended flight test program? Is it going to stay in place or will it move around uh, uh, between uh, flights? Thanks. Yeah, so purely as a, you know, as a terminology, whether you call it a rotorcraft or a helicopter or a drone, you know, you could use those interchangeably. I think one of the connotations of drone here is that it uh, has a little bit of, you know, an off the shelf, you know, you go buy it at your favorite store and, you know, you can fly it out of the box. Uh, Ingenuity is quite different. It had to be designed from the ground up for a very alien, very harsh environment. We don't have drones that, you know, survive minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit at night. We don't have drones that fly in 1% uh, of the atmosphere of Earth. So if you're careful about using the word drone and you remember that this is a very, very, very special drone, you could say drone. Uh, but just want to make sure that people don't lose track of the fact that it's a very special uh, aircraft that's uh, quite unique. Uh, but, you know, if you want to call it a drone, a helicopter, a rotorcraft, depending upon your community and your audience, uh, feel free. Okay, and then Justin, you want to? 
Yes, so the, uh, the rover is actually going to stay at its current location during the next few test flights. Uh, this location was actually, there was a, a fair amount of discussion about where to uh, park for the duration of, of the month of Ingenuity, and the science team spent time debating that and picked this location. There, there are a lot of interesting nearby uh, rocks that the team has actually been, actually over the weekend, uh, doing a lot of the interesting discussion about what, trying to understand where the, the, the local geology, and, um, and they're keeping very busy actually. Uh, I will also um, mention too that this is this is giving the team a chance to just look at all the data. We've been also been using MassCam Z and the SuperCam RMI remote microscopic imager to take really uh, detailed pictures of the delta remnants. And there's been a lot of discussion about which way should we head into the delta? Should we do, should we go one way or the other way? And so this is giving the team a chance to um, get caught up on all of that too. So so we're going to be parked right where we are. Um, we like this location, and I, would, I don't know if any of us mentioned, but the heli is about 70 meters away from where we are right now, 69 to 70 meters. Uh, so uh, we like that vantage point. As you can see, we get a good view of the heli, so we're, we're happy with the current location. Okay, um, we're gonna take another media question. This one is Rose Ann Aragon from KPRC TV. Thank you so much for taking my question and congratulations. Uh, this is sort of whoever would like to answer this. I understand that you have done hundreds of simulations of this. I'm interested to know, is there something that you have learned that's significant that was not in line with what you had predicted with the simulation other than the dust and the cameras, of course? It looks like, uh, you know, like it did in simulations. It's, you know, again, we, we're going to get more data, and so we're going to mine through that, and we're going to learn things from that, and there may be things there that, that are unexpected. But just looking at what we've seen so far, it certainly, you know, flies very much like what we uh, predicted in our simulations, which is, which is really uh, great. And as far as the dust, yes, uh, are, you know, fears about having obscurations from dust uh, near the ground do not seem to be borne out. We always knew that there was uncertainty with that, and we always took a cautious approach to it in terms of how we designed it. And I'm happy that we did, And uh, but um, it doesn't seem like the, the worst uh, concerns in that area uh, came true. And just to add to that, uh, this morning, uh, Jaco Karras, who was looking at the telemetry from the motor and the server controls, he said, telemetry just looks exactly like what we see in the chamber. <laughs> so uh, anyway, over the, it is looking really good, and, uh, but we'll be scarring through the data. This is what tech demo is about. So we will be looking at the high definition, uh, you know, uh, high rate data uh, to, over the next few days. Uh, oh, Justin, do you wanna add yeah. something? I'll just add uh, from the imaging point of view, we've learned a lot from this first flight. Uh, it's very hard, as you might imagine, it's very hard to simulate a helicopter at 70 meters full speed spin uh, to get the timing. And so we're going to take what we learned from our imaging today, we're gonna work to improve the additional flight imaging attempts. So stay tuned and uh, we're hoping to have even better video, video to show. Great, okay. Thank you so much. And Go ahead. with the full scope of understanding the, the vehicle itself, where will this helicopter be the most productive and that would bring the most information on Mars? Thomas, do you wanna take that? There are many areas on Mars that frankly, we would like to have more information about and uh, that information is not accessible in any fashion by rover. And so for me, if I was to make a prediction and again, you know, uh, Yogi Berra said it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, and that also applies here. But uh, if I was to make a prediction, I would say the first type of applications are in one or another location like this, especially crater walls or specific craters where we just can't get in, you know, and, and we would like to see what's there and how the walls are composed. But uh, some other, somebody else may have a different idea here on the panel, or I'm sure in the science community with 10 scientists will have 20 ideas. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna take another social media question. Uh, maybe Mimi can start with this, but it probably applies to everyone, especially the people on our video conference. Um, Stephanie Lee on Twitter says, 
How is the Mars helicopter team going to celebrate this amazing accomplishment? <laughs> well, um, okay, I'll answer. Uh, first of all, um, this is the first day in our six, seven years of effort that we feel licensed to celebrate just the way we are. The worst one of them, George Ravish, another one, Teddy Zenatos is another one. There are a few who have never let me celebrate fully <laughs> that have always said, not yet, not yet. And so we've had a long journey. You know, we came from a little prototype to a risk reduction vehicle to engineering development model to ingenuity and then how to get onto the rover getting launched and then surviving the launch and surviving the drop and, you know, and here we are. Every step has been huge. and. We have never allowed ourselves to celebrate fully. So yes, we will be celebrating 100% uh, fully. We're authorized for the first time. But I'm sorry to disappoint you. We don't know what our party plan is. Uh, at least the WebEx happy hour. Now, Bob, uh, do you want to chime in? Bob is usually, can you tell? He's our chief engineer and innovator. So he, he always thinks out of the box. I don't know, Bob, what should we say? Oh, I don't know, Mimi. I think uh, we could look to you for leadership even here. Jeez, then we're in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, that's a great question. <laughs> well, I know we're under COVID conditions, but hopefully you could see everybody smiling under their masks. <laughs> All right, we're going to go back to the media lines. Uh, we have uh, Kin Song Lee from Hong Kong Cable News. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'd like to ask, uh, what's the meaning of this slide for the uh, aerodynamic studies? And I hope you could explain a bit more on uh, whether we could fly uh, other kinds of aircraft on other planets. Thank you. Bovard? Yeah, so it's, it's very significant in terms of validating, you know, the aerodynamic modeling that we've done in this project. Uh, so, you know, I, I say, you know, it looks like what we've simulated and, and, and that's great because it, it validates, you know, the work that they've done. It means, you know, we got it right. Uh, and that is a huge, uh, uh, huge thing in this case. And we'll, we'll, of course, learn more as we get additional data and do uh, additional flights uh, for that. And, it's as, and so as far as, uh, as doing flights elsewhere, I think maybe Thomas uh, could comment on, on that. So I think there are a number of uh, flights we would like to do on Mars, right? And, and we need to figure out uh, what the right places are to go and the right applications for that. And my hope is that science communities around the world are starting to focus on this. Uh, going to Titan is something we're already working on right now with a vehicle called Dragonfly that, we're, uh, that is under development. And, and even though that's a very different atmosphere aerodynamically, the, a lot of the lessons learned here is how to test these vehicles and how to get them ready and actually put them in place. I think a lot of these uh, lessons learned here are actually utterly applicable. There's other bodies, of course, in the solar system with atmospheres, and I would not be surprised if great ideas can come about uh, to go to these as well. Uh, but uh, but th those are the two we're working, the two obvious places to think about right now. Okay. Um, all right. We have another caller on the media lines, uh, Ken Kramer of Space Up Close. Go ahead. Thank you very much, and congratulations to the whole team. Um, I have a question. Um, if you, after the, for the fifth flight, if you get that far, is there any possibility that you might fly the helicopter towards the, the path that you're going to drive the rover and then drive past, if you do that, would you then drive up to the uh, helicopter and take some pictures of it and inspect it and see what it looks like? And for Thomas, do you have any room on the 2026 lander for a helicopter? Thanks. Well, um, for the fifth flight, after as much as I can push her bar to go as far as possible, I, I care about going really far and really fast. Um, that number, which I'm really hoping is, you know, 600 meters kind of distance, um, and, you know, as fast as we can go is what we care about. I have to say I did share with uh, uh, Ken Farley and uh, Mars 2020, we don't care which direction. We really want to push the helicopter flight in the distance. So I would like to, you know, turn the question over to uh, Ken Farley and Mars 2020 folks, if there is a preferred direction. So that is a conversation to come. 
So from our perspective, we want to push the distance and the speed. So stay tuned. And so uh, you asked me, uh, hey, can you ask me about uh, 26, or, you know, the, the more sample return uh, campaign? I just want to tell you, the more sample return campaign, the most important thing we need to do is keep it uh, streamlined as possible. There's a lot of things we could be adding to this, and, uh, you know, uh, science instruments, tests, and other things, and, and, and frankly, uh, the, the campaign that we have in front of us is very much focused on one, exactly one key objective, and that is to bring the samples back to Earth. And everything that we're doing is supporting that objective. So, so uh, technology demonstrations, uh, you know, are a really critical part. I think uh, Mike Watkins said it well at the right, at the beginning. Uh, we want to see wherever we can do it. I just want to also uh, mention that for many missions, focus is a very critical part as well. And, and so often, what we need to do as explorers is have uh, two opposing thoughts in, in our minds at the same time. So that's what's going to happen here also. Okay. All right. So thank you. We're going to uh, take another media question. Manuel Mazzanti from Debate. Hello, everybody. Uh, congratulations. Uh, NASA, JPL, the entire team, even the guys remotely. This is an historic day. Uh, Mimi, your enthusiasm is contagious, definitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, a question for you, or maybe for, for Harvard, uh, the 96 degree rotation of the helicopter was done to see uh, how the, the helicopter responds to certain commands, or was it done to point the camera towards the rover? And I wonder if we are going to be able to see the rover from the ingenu ingenuity perspective. So we wanted to make a turn uh, because it you know, goes a little bit further than than just a straight up and down flight. And the particular uh, turn that we did there, the 96 degree turn uh, clockwise, uh, did put the camera, uh, the return to earth camera pointed towards the rover. We did not take a picture with that camera during its flight, but it does set us up uh, for potentially doing that for the next flight. As far as whether we will see the rover or not, it uh, depends a little bit. The, on, on exactly the state that the helicopter is in when that picture is snapped. Uh, because the camera is angled downwards at an angle where it doesn't see all the way to the horizon in uh, level flight. And so it, you have to get a little bit lucky uh, to, to, get, to catch the rover in that image. So we don't have any guarantees that we will actually have that. Thank you. Justin? I'll just add one thing to that, uh, because people do ask that question about imaging the rover with the camera. The, the original intent or plan was to have the camera rotated in portrait mode, so uh, that the, the long end of the field of view would look up just, just above the horizon and we would take the, um, the picture of the rover. But late during development, and Bob can even talk about it a little more, the, um, there, was, there was an issue with the, the configuration and it had to be changed and mounted in landscape mode. So that's the story of why it is tricky to get that picture of the rover itself. Okay, great, thank you. And thanks to everyone for all of their questions. If you're a member of the media and you still have more questions, you can contact JPL's digital news and media office. We will help you uh, get interviews or everything you need. And if you're on social media, we'll continue to answer questions uh, with the hashtag Mars Helicopter online. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for this. And uh, for more on Ingenuity, you can visit go.nasa.gov slash Ingenuity. Uh, we'll put the latest updates there. And if you want to learn more about the Perseverance rover, visit mars.nasa.gov slash Perseverance. There's a link in there to the raw images. And so if you, too, want to drink from the fire hose, <laughs> we have a place for you to go. All right. And if you're on social media, you can join our conversation at NASA JPL. Um, again, you can use the hashtag MarsHelicopter. Thank you for watching and go Ingenuity.